Hi everybody, this is Trevor Jones from astrobackyard.com and in this video I'm going to talk about the seven mistakes beginners always make in astrophotography. So the way this is going to go is that I'm basically going to talk to my younger self six, seven years ago, heck even two years ago, some of the big mistakes I made and stuff I wish I knew earlier and so to help you guys avoid those situations and progress your personal progress in astrophotography further without some of the headaches that uh, I experienced. This is gonna cover deep sky astrophotography through a telescope. So the first one, and you're gonna hear some differing opinions on this one, I feel like the telescope you choose early on to start with can have a huge impact on your enjoyment and sustainment of astrophotography. The big thing is you don't wanna start out with too much focal length, too much magnification. When you shoot with a wide field instrument, it's so much more forgiving on all the things that are really demanding and difficult early on, like polar alignment and your tracking and your auto guiding. All these things are a little bit easier if you choose a wide field instrument. So the best choice I think is a small wide field refractor. If you watch this channel, there's no surprises there. So a small compact wide field refractor is light. It takes crisp, beautiful images and the wide field aspect of it makes it so much more forgiving when it comes to the critical elements of successful astrophotography, such as polar alignment, star alignment, and finding objects, tracking, and auto guiding. So start with a wide field refractor. That would be my advice there. Number two is a big one. This is just being smart and unfortunately not something that I figured out until probably years later and it's that choose the right target or subject in the night sky for your location and the time of year. It would be nice to say, you know what, I'm in the mood to shoot the Andromeda Galaxy today, so uh, I'll just find out where it is and shoot it. That's not a smart idea. Use a planetarium app such as Stellarium to see what's in the night sky now. Something that's in a good position to track over the course of a night that you can actually get three to four hours worth of exposure. Even if you don't, it's just a subject that's possible to collect that amount of time in a convenient location of the night sky, meaning something that doesn't start straight up at the zenith because as you're tracking with a telescope, that's gonna be a headache. You're gonna have to do a meridian flip soon after you get started. And something that's high enough in altitude in the sky where you're actually gonna get some shots with some good transparency and you're not looking through too much atmosphere to get a blurry kind of image. An example for that is right now, Cassiopeia and those nebulae there, the Heart Nebula and the Soul Nebula, those are in a great spot where they're high enough to clear the roof of my house. They're in a convenient location of the sky where there aren't many obstructions and I can collect three to four hours before doing a meridian flip. But of course, as the seasons change, the positions change too. So plan your projects out for your location. The other side of the coin is for your gear. You gotta know what the strengths of your telescope and camera are. So that depends on you know the sensor size of your camera and also the focal length of your lens or your telescope. So if it is something, say, in the 250 millimeter range, that's extremely wide. So you can do projects like, to reference again, the Heart and Soul Nebula in a single shot. But there should be no surprises there. Plan your projects out. Use the tools in software like Stellarium that actually you can punch in your sensor size and your focal length and your specific gear details and you'll see the frame, what the size of the object is gonna be in your image. So plan it out, shoot for your location and your gear. Plan out your projects that way as opposed to just picking something that you wanna shoot in the night sky. Stick to something that's gonna give you some promising results. Number three, and these aren't in any particular order, is to start shooting using narrow band filters. Even if you're shooting with a color camera, one-shot color or DSLR, by taking, using a narrow band filter and collecting images in these narrow band wavelengths, you can add very impactful details to your existing photos. Now, I think I shot for about four or five years with a color DSLR, maybe three, four years before I started using a narrow band filter to isolate details. So the benefits of that are when you're shooting from the city and heavy light pollution, you can ignore all of that. You can shoot in uh, moonlight and still collect useful signal on nights like that that you can add to your color projects. Maybe you just wanna shoot 
with these narrowband filters and create these dramatic black and white high contrast images, those are beautiful too. But what I really like to do is when the, when the moon isn't out to shoot in color, when the moon is out, shoot with a narrowband hydrogen alpha filter with my DSLR and blend that into my color images and it really adds a punch to it. Wherever you put that signal, whether it's in the, the red channel for, for the emission nebulae or as a luminance layer, adding those narrowband details to your color images really makes a pop. And uh, just as an example, when I first shot the California Nebula with my DSLR camera, and it was stock, I should mention. It just wasn't there. I, no matter how much time I put into it, I just have to pull the details out and I wasn't getting that strong impact that I saw in all the amazing photos of the California Nebula online. So with my modified DSLR camera and shooting with an H-alpha filter, boom, I just got that extremely bright, strong signal of that hydrogen gas in that target. So combining a modified DSLR camera or dedicated astronomy camera with narrowband filters is a huge plus. And uh, it's something that I didn't get into until far later. As, as I started the Astro Backyard channel, it was, it was still brand new to me. There's a mistake I made early on, not getting narrowband filters earlier. This is a big one, and this is one I feel very strongly about, and it's don't overanalyze your auto guiding. So a lot of amateur astrophotographers, myself included, use a software called PHD2 Guiding, and it runs your guide camera through a small telescope or through an off-axis guider. And basically its job is to lock onto a star, measure whether it's moving too much to show errors in your tracking, and make corrections to the mount by sending a small pulse to make a correction. The, the system is, is rather simple what it's actually doing. The problem is, when people look into the specs of the guide, their guiding graph and all the technical details and they just scrutinize the absolute shit out of these mounts and they obsess over those numbers and I, I think that some people are dumping the images. They're not actually judging by the pictures that are being taken but by those numbers in the graph and comparing it to others and it just becomes a huge mess. What I would say there is, yes, the basics need to be there. You need to be polar aligned, balanced, to choose a, a correct guide star with a great saturation. Everything has to be working as it should, but after that, don't go crazy scrutinizing the graph. Let your pictures decide. As an example, the graph in a recent video I made didn't look so great. My RMS error didn't look great. It was something like over three seconds, yet my images at a focal length of over a thousand millimeters were pin sharp, those just absolutely sharp images, five minutes long. So obviously the guiding was working great, the tracking was just fine, but the graph didn't reflect that. So don't obsess over that. And I'd say, let the pictures you're taking decide before you go too crazy looking at those specs. Here's another one that uh, actually falls in line perfectly after not over analyzing your guiding is dithering. Now this is such a simple concept it's essentially between each image that you take. It's gonna shift the camera a few pixels around. You can, you can choose these settings. And all it's gonna do is get rid of that noise pattern by canceling itself out, essentially. When in your stacking software, you're gonna line up and register all the images on top of each other. And of course, that signal is gonna keep stacking on top of each other and lining up, whereas that noise pattern is gonna smooth out because it's it's being layered on, layered on top of each other in different positions. So dithering is one way to really improve the quality of your stacked image and it's such a simple and easy thing to do. So using a camera automation software, I'll talk about that next, you can just have the setting for dithering on and all of them do it, whether you're using a DSLR, I did it with Backyard EOS, you want to make sure that dithering setting is on and then all it is is about 10 to 15 seconds depending on your settings between each image frame to really improve your final stacked image and it's such a game changer it's something that i kind of early on thought you know it's nice to have don't always need it but without it you're going to run into situations where if you have a slight and constant tracking error where you're kind of moving towards one direction you're gonna get real ugly artifacts like walking noise, where the noise, as you stack it, is in the same pattern going along the same trail, and that's just a nightmare to process out. 
Uh, so I, anything you can do to avoid that, but dithering is the answer there and it's just a game changer. You need to dither, dither or die as they say. I can't remember what number we're on now, but the, the next mistake I made was not using image acquisition software. So uh, camera control software, whatever you wanna call it. When I started out, I would literally use the delay timer on my DSLR camera press the shutter down and walk away for a three minute sub and continue doing that throughout the night. There's other things you can get like a remote shutter release cable or an intervalometer. I still love using that method. Dedicated software like Backyard, EOS or Astrophotography Tool or Sequence Generator Pro really can make your life easier. And I'm not talking just for people that want a fully automated setup and walk away and the telescope just does its whole thing all night even for those backyard imagers that are out there with the camera. You want something like this for the tools like dithering and to just really maximize your time under the stars. So you can set a sequence of 50 three minute images and with dithering in between and it will run, the program will run your sequence without a hitch and it just makes life so much easier. There's a lot of other tools in there for focusing and framing. You can magnify and all these things you can't do on your DSLR camera, or especially your, your dedicated astronomy camera, you rely on this software to control it completely. Not getting up to speed with th these types of software early on is something that I was a little scared of and I avoided for a little too long, but once you find a software you like, and I, I like to use astrophotography tool these days, so there's a mistake I, I did early on was not using a camera control software earlier. This is the last mistake I made early on that uh, I didn't know and this was very recently, this was only maybe a year and a half ago and it was not processing my images on a per channel basis. So as I started using a monochrome camera that just shoots black and white and that you have to shoot through different filters, RGB and your luminance or narrow band, these are black and white images that you have to build into a color image. And that kind of got the wheels turning that, you know what, when I, even when I shoot with a color camera like a DSLR or dedicated astronomy camera, one shot color, you can still harness the same kind of power of processing these black and white images and building an image and really have more control over your image processing. So I use Adobe Photoshop, you just go into the channels palette and you can break down your color image in the RGB channels and take a look at the data that was collected through each channel at a time. Then you're not just looking at it and, and analyzing it, you take those channels out and process them separately and independently. Then you can do things like control the star size for each color. Sometimes that blue channel has bloated stars but the rest don't. Uh, you can sharpen individual channels Oftentimes that green channel is nice and smooth, whereas the blue channel is noisier, so you can apply just the noise reduction to the blue channel only. I wouldn't go back to any other way of processing now. That per channel basis processing is the only way to go. So if you're shooting with a DSLR camera, I urge you to look at those channels and try processing each channel separately and then building your images that way. And like I said, there's a mistake I've made not doing that for the last eight, nine years. So there's a very recent change I made and a mistake that I was making. I hope these practical tips were useful to you. I know it was a little all over the map, but hopefully if you stuck it out to the end, you got at least one little nugget of information that can improve your astrophotography. If this style of video is helpful to you, there's, I've got, you know, a million things in my head to share about astrophotography and, you know, what I've learned in the last 10 years. So if it was helpful for you, please leave a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments what was the most useful, or if you just hated it and want to give me a thumbs down, that's fine too. But until next time, I hope you keep watching these videos and improving your astrophotography. Until next time, clear skies.